and screen sharing now. Okay, again, so welcome to the 160 week four session. We're looking at a screen grab of the email I fired off to everybody. But what we'll do is, and again, we talked about this last week, we can take a look at, make sure project two and three have been, <coughs> excuse me, successfully or to the best of our abilities to the stage in the stage of the game, completed as uh, best we can get those things done. So there's a couple of little items in two and three that pop up on a semi-regular basis. And I know most of these have already been handed in. There might be a couple of people who yet still have to hand that in or might need to make a, a little change or revision. So what I'm gonna do is just show what the typical little hurdles or speed bumps are in those projects and the quick way to resolve them. So I'll jump over into Illustrator. One of the biggest things with project two is that seems to be an issue is making sure everybody has gotten rid of all the outlines in an object. And it's easy to find the outlines in an object when I'm looking at them. Sometimes I can just spot them. And there are clearly times when you're clicking on individual objects one at a time with the direct selection tool to select them and then give them a particular shade of gray. So you can separate back, middle, and foreground elements from each other and contain a bundle of different grays in those areas and then work through contrast and maybe a little bit of blur to add visual interest depth, image separation and such. But to get rid of all the outlines at once, you don't select each one of those objects one at a time. You just select the entire image, whether it's this or this. Get the stroke chip and click on the red backsplash. There, that's it. All the strokes are gone. You don't have to cherry pick them out one at a time. Same thing over here. So that's why it's very easy. And I'm not joking when I say it takes seconds to do that. Because I'll find outlines behind some of the uh, leaves or around some of the leaves in Highland Road. Having outlines around windows is a very popular thing or around the word shop, the letters there. Or out here, outlines around under mountain forest, outlines around trees or some objects that are in the background, there's outlines there. Select your object or just if it's a group, ungroup bunch of objects, select everything, get the stroke chip, get rid of them all. That's simple. But that's common enough and it's certainly, it's worth um, mentioning. So you really want to address that. And that's something you need to be aware of just moving forward with Illustrator. And again, it's one of a million little one-offs. Uh, lots of people did it, but it's simple enough to resolve because we want to make sure that we're, for this particular project, that we're trying to separate images and have middle foreground definition and depth and contrast occurring to define those areas and a little bit of blur for visual interest and added compositional depth without outlines framing anything. Nothing in the world we see has outlines on it. It's all defined by shadow, shape, form, you know, contrast and such. So that's all that is. And there's different ways to access this exact same red backslash for non-existence in like all programs. So a little thing like that, that's it. That's all you have to do. I have received a few of these projects where I, I don't know why, but people have gone and ungrouped everything. Don't ungroup things. You don't need to. Otherwise, you might run the risk of moving content around. You don't want that. So inside of a group of objects or objects inside of a clipping mask, which is the shop, just use the white arrow, the white direct, direct selection tool. And if you want to multi-select different objects for a similar fill, hold the shift key down and select other objects and then get the eyedropper tool and then fill. Standard sort of operating procedure and practice for Illustrator and for multi-selecting and using eyedropper tools to fill in lots of content. So that I feel has been resolved now. <laughs> so moving on to over here, a couple of things that seem to be uh, that come up. I have a little color panel up here and I'm in 
stroke chip mode and I'm in CMYK. We talked about this before, but again, it's one of a million little one-offs to remember. It's, that's a lot to remember it's next to impossible. So that's why there's repetition here. So if I have this magenta at 100% and yellow here at 100% and the blue or cyan at 100%, I've been moving these around. So that's why they're like that. These values tend to stay there. So whatever these CMYK values are, they tend not to shift or slide much at all over here in the color panel. The same cannot be said about in CM and RGB mode, but I'm expecting a tiny bit of shifting in color over here. So is this blue, for example, if we go this route, which is fine, because I mentioned that this is perfectly acceptable. I want us to be aware of this panel, as well as working in through the swatches panel. So if that blue is supposed to be just like this, great. And you've done that, and you're on your merry way. Then you go to green. OK, I'll move this to green. And wonderful, now I'll just go check blue again. And you see things have shifted you end up just kind of chasing your tail. I know that this is the way this works. It's a known thing with Illustrator. It's the way it is. So if I see values like that, I know that you went in and worked with the slider and I wanted us to be aware of working with RGB and CMYK color models because we have to shift between the two based on what we're doing. CMYK for print, RGB for digital, screen work. Now, if you choose to want to go a different route, which some people did, which is great, you had, this represents that color up there, or any color, I'll just make it anything. But then you go into the swatches panel, click new swatch, and just like the video shows, go into color mode, change to RGB. Then if I want that to be green, I can go like that, go, yeah, okay, wonderful. There it is, I'll put that there, then I'll go, and make a magenta. There we go. Okay. Now, when I go back and click on this green, you end up with the tint value. That doesn't change. So it still stays at one, registers as 100%. But if I go to RGB, that happens. Just something we need to be aware of. I expect that. So, depending which route you want to go, they're both good. So hopefully in regards to part one of this little color systems, that makes sense. And it might take some of the stress or confusion again out of what's going on here. So we really want to, you know, again, just be aware of CMYK versus RGB and additive and subtractive um, lighting situation. So and over here, this is, the RGB mode, we're adding light and we keep getting more and more light until we're bright with all the overlapping. And over here, we're subtracting light with the ink CMYK until we've removed all light and we're black with all the overlapping. And we get introduced to color, model, <coughs> color modes <coughs> and we're in RGB, hue, saturation, brightness, different reasons for using that CMYK um, and other color models. We need to be aware of those, where to access those. And then in the swatches panel, being able to create a new swatch and then in color mode, just save. Oh, do I hear a voice? I thought maybe somebody was asking a question. And then in here we go and do that and choose RGB CMYK and still assign whatever we're going to assign in here. Click OK and then these get systematically added into and saved into our swatches panel. Over here, we're just simply just changing the value of something. Over here in swatches, we're actually creating a color value and saving it in the swatches panel. Either way though, we end up in some form of color mode and all we're stick doing right now is RGB and CMYK, which we migrated to after using grayscale for our contrast experiments, visual um, treatments. So for those of you that were scratching your heads over that, this is me just saying this again. So it's not you, it's Illustrator, but yeah, we know how to work with those panels. There over here, I've seen some interesting treatments here. So we have 
all these tints, for example, remember there's a quick way to be able to, I'm just selecting all of those. I can go just like this and marquee them off or hold the shift key down. But to create a 50% saturation. So that's what this should look like. We have, this should look like that when it's done. So we have these visual references here so we know what we're trying to create ultimately. So we have a sense of them. So with these, we select all of these, and then you can just go straight up into the menu bar and choose edit, edit colors, saturate. Put that down to negative 50. So we're removing, that's close enough. Click OK. Oops, select them all that way. I had the others, some other stuff selected. There. There, that's do it. And again, this is what we did last week. It's a quick way to. Ta-da, we're done. So when I click on this and I'm in CMYK mode, I'll see something kind of like this. For the primary colors, the yellows, I'll see around 50%. For the uh, magentas, around 50%. And for the cyans, this is what happens. It's just the way it is. But we've desaturated that, so we're only at 50% saturation. What you can't do, though, when I click on these, is take this, and I, you can tell that it's happened. This has been used as something where you eyedrop or sample from this. That's never going to be accurate because this is a PDF file that I put in here as a JPEG. So the colors look nice, but if you take that, say one of these, I'll take that, and then eyedrop or sample from there, I'm going to end up with very specific colors, uh, values, that only sampling from here will put on these. So we don't want to sample from this. That's not going to give us any sense of accuracy, nor will it get us to work with different tools that we need to be aware of. Or for something simple like tints, when everything is going to have 50% of the saturation removed, it's easy just to select that entire column of color and choose edit, edit colors, Saturate and just go to negative 50. Now, over here with the shades of black, you have to select each black individually and go to see each color individually and go to shades, <clears throat> adjust the shades and adjust the black value to 50%. That's what has to happen there. So if I take this yellow, Yeah, around there, 50%. That's it. So when I take this and move it over here, I start to see how accurate the colors are. And if there's a little color shifting because there's just eyedropper sampling from this file here, I can tell that the eyedropper tool is most likely used to sample colors from here. So, so when I select that 50, when I select that in that 50 area, go down here, 50, you just, and just go down and copy and paste. So when I click on each of these, 50%. So that's what we're looking for there because we're, we are creating a shade and we're adding black to that. You can't just select all of these and then just go 50% because that's what'll happen. It's whatever the foreground color is, they all get affected and changed and converted to that. So hopefully that adds a little clarity to people that might need that. And then over here with the tones, depending on whether if you've sampled from eyedropper sampled from here, you will end up with these different kind of values. And down here in the K, there should be 25% black. There's nothing. And down here, like 1%. So there's, there's nothing there. That means this has been sampled from again. So get this out of the way. What I would do here is, and depending on the sequence you do this in, I'll toss this out of the way. 
Toss that out of the way. Because we can saturate all this down 50%. If I take all that and choose edit colors, saturate, I can just select all of those at once and just 50% done. And then when I go through each one and add the 25% that's supposed to be in there, skip down here. And so when I click on these, I'll see 25% for, for K. But if you decide to go this route, and then take all of these, <coughs> excuse me, and then remove, some of the saturation, I'm going to see 12 and a half because you've desaturated the 25% black to 50%. So half of 25 is 12 and a half. And again, I want to make us just aware of the tools. So if I see 12 and a half or 25, I'll be fine making ourselves aware of the tools. So over here with tones, it's the sequencing. Shades, you just have to choose each one and move the black, the case slider over to 50%. Intense, you can, that's the kind of thing you can just select them all and go straight over to edit colors and desaturate. So hopefully that adds a little bit of um, clarity or reinforcement to what we're doing with these two components. So when we go back to project one, we're just visually taking a look at and appreciating black and white, then gray. So we get middle range, background and foreground colors through contrast, then allow a little blur to add visual interest and reinforce some depth of field or focus to some area. And we do that with project one. And we can see the results of that in grayscale. Then we go and apply that here into these projects where you get to cherry pick two of the three and assign three, five, or 10 in one of them. And whatever you chose, you can't repeat that again for colors or shades. And then you have to just go with one of the other two choices or options left for shades and fill in with no outlines the shapes here to create good contrast, the image depth, lots of good clarity with, keep it, uh, with the shapes, create some kind of, use some light source to create some kind of consistent lighting where if the light's up here, this little crevice might be really light, but over here, it's gonna be very dark. So some effort made towards creating the dark and light areas where a light source would suggest they be, that sort of thing, but removing the outlines very quickly. And then they're just getting rid of the color. And then we start looking at color and looking at ways to, beyond just working with primary hues, or we start with the, well, the primary is yellow, magenta, I'll just say yellow, red, blue. Then we start converting those into uh, secondary and tertiary colors. So you get to try 12 primary colors, and that's wonderful. Now, what can we do with those? You can't just create with only those. So there has to be values of all of these, lighter and darker, or both. So you get tints and shades and tones. Tints, think of it as adding white. Shades, adding black, tones, adding black and white. So everything between uh, the, the lightest tint to the darkest uh, shade will end up creating all the different colors under the rainbow. And then these are just on a white background for the sake of visual contrast between these on a white background and the same colors on a black background. So just visual appreciation for that kind of treatment. That's, that's it. So once we get into something like this, this project, we're doing the warm to cool color conversion. So we take these warm colors, target them and convert them to something cooler. So we go around the color wheel from warm where this photograph has these uh, predominant colors 
And through different selection means and non-destructive editing, we create adjustment layers and move over into the cool range. Because this, and the reason is, very generally, we want to create a different feel with the same exact imagery by just simply changing the colors. So working with those color shifts and changes and adding some contrast with the lighter and darker elements, we can go from here into that without having to wait six months for a seasonal change and go to this location and to take photographs. And this is our introduction into working with um, basic layers, some blending modes again that we've worked with in uh, the one 20 class, uh, selections, layer masks, and adding new layers, layer management and structuring, and a couple of basic filters, like blur and overlay to create the illusion of some snow. And then we select the content in these layers and scale them up in size. So we end up having larger snowflakes in front of us. Then with a little blur, which echoes back to earlier projects, then we create the illusion of a little bit more depth because not we don't want everything to be sharp focus. So we just say, hey, let's make the objects in the foreground or the background blurrier. If things are near us, they'll be larger and we could choose to make those blurrier. But that's sort of the rationale behind what we're doing here. And now I know a, a lot of people have yet to, and we were the plan was today, we were going to, and it still is, we take a look at and address any project two questions. And I'd like to think I've addressed any concerns with project two at this time. If there are any other project two and three questions right now, would probably be a good time to ask them. So if there are, lay it on me. I'll take that sign of crickets. Good, we're good. So then that takes us into project four. So I'd like to build up some comfort level with us in project four. And I think we can get a lot of these the signed off in class today through screen share. Now with project four, we need to be aware of and keep in mind that there are requirements. It's not just anything. So when we look at this, I've had a couple of submissions. We don't want our image to be any larger than 2000 by 2000 pixels. So we have to be aware of image size. So we change that. I would suggest changing the image size of your document or your file sooner rather than later. That way you're not waiting for your computer to process information. It doesn't need to process. I've had a couple of projects sent where the image, the files have been 7,000 pixels. And I can tell when I'm getting, uh, receiving these. If I'm looking at something from WeTransfer that says, 800 megs, I know that uh, this hasn't been addressed and we have to do, we have to deal with this. So we make sure we're looking at 72 DPI, keep things nice and small from a dots per inch perspective and 2000 by 2000 pixels at the most. If something's 2000 by 1800, fine. As long as one of the dimensions isn't more than 2000. Then we go back and just make sure we're working with the proper blending modes, adjustment layers, proper use of selections and layer masks videos that show all that stuff. And then the non-destructive editing, which is, oh, here, this is probably. Yeah. All this stuff in here, those layers. That way we're never actually physically making contact with the original, the source image. So everything that we're doing is non-destructive. So with this project, would you guys like me to start at the beginning and work through this just to cover all the bases from stem to stern? So you're familiar with what you need to do and then let you guys work on this and then potentially show this to me in class before we have a discussion about where we'll go with project five. Good, we'll do that. I'm thinking, how about this again, I don't want to sprint through all of our material because our projects become a little heavier as we move forward is the plan we sort of scaffold up a bit, ramp up. So why don't we aim to get as much sign off, uh, project four finished and signed off in class as we can today. And then towards the end of the class, I can give you guys 
an idea of what project five will be and we can start on that next week. It's a Photoshop project, but we could start on that next week. And that way we just, we're not always behind schedule, if you will, kind of thing. I know some people might think we're moving too quickly and others might think I'm not moving the class fast enough, but I'd like to make sure we're all at the same pace. And I know we, there's only a few people that have submitted project uh, four. Okay. So does that sound like a reasonable plan? We'll just try to get through as much as we can with project uh, four in class. Yeah, no, this, this project has to be through e-transfer. The reason is the file will just be too large to send as an attachment in an email. The limit for sending um, an unzipped file through an email is probably around 30 or 35 megs. These are going to be way past 35 megs. So you just have to send them to me as a through WeTransfer. It's the only way. Unless you show them to me in class, either way is good. And actually I'll jump back here, make sure we... Yeah. So this project though, remember we have time. It's, on, it's due next week or the week after. And the reason is we're starting something next week and it's going to require uh, some of our time. So you could be working on projects simultaneously. So, and I'm working with the assumption people have never touched Photoshop before. If you've worked with Photoshop, then you'll get through this project in 10 minutes. But I'm not working with the assumption people have experience in Photoshop. Okay, so down here. And then a lot of what we have in here, we, we'll go back and revisit as we move forward a little bit. Okay, so this is what I'm using for reference. Okay. And cross-referencing against when we're going through the, um, the demo on how to accomplish the tasks required for this project. There. Yeah. So finished product. Then we need to start converting this into a cooler scene. And to, so, <clears throat> excuse me, cooler scene. So we need to make sure we're working within the proper dimensions. So this file right now, here's where I am back in Photoshop. And tell me to slow down or speed up, gang. I can appreciate again that some of you just want to sit back with the tea and digest the information, reflect on it later on and work through the project and, and look at the how-to video. Others might want to work along with me. so. I'm just trying my best to balance out the two different speeds. You guys can use uh, the photos I've supplied. That's not a problem. If you have, I uh, mentioned last week, if you brought your own photo that you think would be great for this, show it to me so I know that there's enough warm surface area color, not sky sunset color, but warm surface area color to work with. So you guys would have. This file you might be able to work with, the Fox and the Winter Lab, these are from last week. If you wanted to work with those, that would be fine. And then photo options up here. You could try some of these if you would like. Yeah, and then again, if you've got something that you feel like working with, Uh, this should look familiar. That's from last week. If you've got something you'd like to work with, this let's make sure we're not waste, you're not wasting your time and you're uh, working with something that meets the requirements. So that would look familiar. Okay, so let's here, I'll use this as an example. We can move through this. Once you're familiar with the tools, and these are very, very commonly used tools you'll be able to go through this kind of a project, work with these tools within 10 minutes. So let's just go and change the image size and double check to make sure we're working within the proper parameters. Image, image size, pretty big. So let's take the largest number 
make sure we're linked, we are, and just type in 2000, there. That'll be much better. We've just dropped from 68 megs down to seven. And then we can zoom in again using the zoom tool. But I prefer just to go with the control plus or minus. So there we go. Well, you guys, yeah, well, you need to do what I'm doing. You can't just go and start working on with other uh, tools. I want us to work with the tools that uh, are included in the demo. So we're working with the proper blending modes, proper adjustment layers, and proper use of selections, which takes us into the color range tool and the adjustment layers. Uh, and, and you'll see this is just, and the proper kind are very, very similar kinds of blending modes, but we need to uh, follow along. Yeah, sure, in a bit, Pearl, definitely. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, before we start moving on, yeah, if you can quickly show your image, I can tell you whether it's suitable for working on right now. Now, if anybody okay. else has an image I'll... they'd like to share and just get approval on before we move forward, now's a good time to do that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Pearl, go for it. Um, okay, so this is the image I selected. Perfect. Yeah, that'll work fine. Yeah, and also uh, I'll show you uh, what I have done. Oh, no, we'll we'll move forward from here first because we'll get everybody working at the same time. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, and I think I saw somebody else's name. Yeah, you guys, yeah, just queue up, self queue up and we can take a look and give a thumbs up to your chosen subject matter. Yeah, this is my image. Yeah, we can work with that on the, uh, yeah, we'll put some, yeah. Yeah, okay. we can change the uh, surface area on the bridge and the bridge railings. Yep, yeah, that'll work. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah, that'll work very well. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Oh, I think Prasha. That one has too many cool colors in it. It's already cool. So if you had something with more surface area that had more warm colors, that would be better. It's a nice photo. Are these, these aren't by chance holiday photos of anybody, from anybody? If they are, that'd be kind of cool. Yes, Marion, please show. Yep, sure, sure, precious save. Okay. Yeah, we can work with that surface, that'll work. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, let's take a look at the photos. Some more, please, yeah, this is good. There's lots of ground area for us to work with, so we can put you know, ice and snow there kind of thing, which is what we're trying to do. We need something that makes it uh, worth our while to work with these need-to-know tools. Absolutely, yeah, show yours. Whoever grabs the screen first can show next. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, we can take and put some snow. Yeah, for sure, that'll help. That'll Definitely do. Last semester, there were lots of sunset pictures and we can't you know, put ice in that, hanging in the heavens. Oh, yep, Shasta, yeah, we can. I saw both of those just long enough to say yes to both. <laughs> There's surface. Sorry, I was like trying to stop because I saw someone else go and then I was like, oh God, and then, yeah. No, we can work with those for sure. If we had to take something that was 
cool and convert it to warm, we could go in the opposite direction. So then do the exact, go through the exact same process we're going through now, but in reverse. Minus the snow, of course. Anybody else have anything to try and get a thumbs up on? Okay, I'm going to grab the screen. There, here we are over here. Cross-reference what we're doing against wherever I was in that video. Just for the sake of comparing apples to apples. There we are, there we go. Oh, I know, that's because I, was in, I went to YouTube before. So we're making sure we have the proper image size up to 2000 by 2000. And then I'm making a duplicate of the layer because we're gonna put another blending mode on top of it later on. Now with that top layer selected, let's go and adjust hue and saturation. So back here, I'll make a duplicate of this by dragging and dropping to the create new layer. Come on. And with that layer selected, right down here at the bottom of the layers panel again, just create a new fill or adjustment layer, click on that button, a pop-up menu appears, and there's hue and saturation. And we'll select that. There we go. And all we're doing is desaturating. We're getting rid, we're making this a little uh, lighter. It's too intense for the warmth. So if we just move the saturation to the left, which is an extension of what we were doing um, with those color models. So now we're, it's a more practical application. Yeah, you could fire off the, the picture to me during class if you'd like, and I can take a quick look. So there we have this adjustment layer with some level of saturation. You guys make an executive decision. We don't want to go that route, that got clearly nuts. So just desaturate so it looks cooler. We know what it looks like in a cool environment. So that works fine. Now we just need to be aware of whether we have this adjustment layer attached to and affecting all the layers underneath it or just the layer directly underneath. So if I turn the visibility of the layer directly underneath off, see the layer underneath here now is still being affected. But if I click this little button, only the layer directly underneath, there'd be an outline underneath the layer name is being affected. So I'll let you guys do that. So get something that kind of looks like that. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and I'm just going to go oh, I thought maybe I received a, a file from Prasha. Okay, I'll start screen sharing again. So there we are with that. So we're on our way. I go back here to the how-to video. Same thing. We can go and cherry pick out if we need to an exact, a uh, much closer match to the kind of colors we're trying to remove. Because so right now I'm just desaturating everything. But if I decide to just trash that for just demonstration sake, go like that, bring another hue and saturation out, and then go into my little channels, maybe I'll, I'll try to maybe be a little more selective with the yellows only. You can see the blue in the guy's jacket sort of stays the same. It doesn't really shift very much. You can try, uh, you know, work with some of these and see what may or may not be affected. So that's equally as valid as for what we're doing, 
because it shows control over non-destructive editing. And we're choosing because of the nature of what we're working with, choosing the uh, hue and saturation. Kind of like that. So we've got that as an option or that as an option. Either one would work for me. And then we make sure that we're only affecting the layer directly underneath our adjustment layer. And that's where we click on here. So it's called we're actually clipping it to the layer below, like a you know paper clip kind of there. I'm probably if you wanted to fire me that picture, uh, you could maybe even just do as whatever picture you have in whatever format it's in. If it's small enough to send as an email unzipped attachment, you could just send it to me during class. I'll take two seconds and take a look at it and give you a thumbs up if that works. Okay, so there, we can work with that. Because I work with the yellow in there. But I go into these in the property panel for your adjustment layer to check to see what's been done. And that's all I'm doing in this little demo, the one minute section. And the hue and saturation adjustment layer, incredibly common. Now let's put another layer on top of there. This time it'll be a solid fill. And you can see just as it is a standalone adjustment layer, solid fill, just a nice, we'll pick a nice dark blue because we're going for warm to cool. So this is cooler, we, but we can't see through it. It's a solid color with a normal kind of blending mode, which means we need to go and change the blending mode and or the opacity, but the blending mode will let the integrity of the color pixels underneath resonate much truer, depending on the kind of blending mode. Blending modes are all about overlapping colors. Opacity is just going to make this semi-transparent and not necessarily as, uh, everything underneath not necessarily as vibrant. Yeah. And combinations work very well as well, but you can see at around 47%, it's transparent, that blue is trans transparent, but it's awful to look at. So, and I'm just cross-referencing to a finished example of the file. So soft light, that would work maybe based on the colors you have in your image. If you have a different image, maybe something other than soft light would work. And in your downloads from last week, I gave you guys a Word document that had technical definitions of all the different blending modes, if that's the kind of thing you like to collect. See, so that looks a little more realistic. So. If Go back to Photoshop. There. On this top layer selected, if I create a new adjustment layer, and I'm just choosing to select this layer because if I select any other layer, I'll do this. And it's not a big deal. If I go here and choose solid color, that layer, that adjustment layer just appears directly above the layer I had selected. It just saves me the step of having to move that ultimately up above. That's all. So if I go there, solid, choose a nice, like a cool blue. That'll work. Could go over there, it's all good. Click OK. And adjust the blending mode. Soft light seems to work well. You might like overlay. You can explore, explore some of the other effects just to see what might look best based on the imagery you're working with. So if I go with soft light and adjust the opacity a little bit, drop it down, and then turn off. Maybe I'll move that up a bit. Or if I decide I don't like that blue because it's an adjustment layer, well, I can make an adjustment. I'll just double click on there. Brings the color picker up, maybe. 
choose a different color. You can see the change being reflected in your document immediately. So before, after. And it just takes a little while to get used to where the tools are. Once you do, you can do this very, very quickly. And when you work in Photoshop, you'll be using adjustment layers all the time. Solid fill, hue and saturation, brightness, contrast. They all get, <laughs> they all work in the same manner. So how is that working for you guys? Not too bad? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward so far. So you guys tell me to slow down or speed up or repeat something because I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page here. Okay, so back here, that's all very nice. So we're just creating an overall different kind of... Okay, okay that's unfortunate. Your audio isn't working. Just yeah, restart. So we're creating a different overall kind of color scheme is all we're doing. It's part and parcel of the warm to cool conversion. Now we can cherry pick out by selecting the layer that has our object in it, some surface area that we're going to put something on. We're gonna make, create a selection and that something is gonna be going to be some white, which will simulate some sort of snow or frost, which will certainly be cooler and that's why we need surface area because we don't want snow and ice and frost sticking to air molecules. It doesn't make any sense. So we get into the color range tool. And based on our selection here, we can see what we have here. We will make a mask of this and that's the way we can, and the mask is based on, our selection is based on the eyedropper tool sampling of this image here. And we can always add or subtract from our mask. And see this way, you can see the selections that are being made in the grasp down below here. If there's some white with blurry edges on it applied this way, that looks a little more authentic. And it looks better than just having a bunch of white blanket covering everything. So it looks as though snow's reaching just the tops of objects and sticking to them and not others. And with a selection made, we can go here and we can create a mask. And because it's on a layer, it's called a layer mask and it's another way of non-destructively editing. So that's what's happening there. So I make sure I start with this selection on its own blank layer. So selections will travel around as you click through layers. I clicked on the add new layer icon. So this is now on its own layer. And white or black will add or subtract from your mask. Values of gray have you sort of fade from one to another, visible or invisible, black or white, add or subtract. Right. So in this case, I'm just going the long-handed way to fill this selection in with white. So back here, that's selected, filled with white. Can always muck around with the opacity then and we need to get rid of this up there because that's we don't want that in the sky clicking there creates a mask out of that selection and we can then maybe get rid of if we want to some of the mask up here so you can see as i'm painting with black that fills in darker black which is re revealing more of the image underneath so it's getting rid of some of the mask it's a subjective thing based on uh, the removal and addition or removal of the mask using black or white. It, my choices here are just sub, are subjective based on the color of the content I'm working with. There. So if I go back here, I'll go down here and use this as my object for making the uh, mask from. 
So I need to get the process started by creating a selection. No, I could have done that first. It doesn't matter the sequence here. If I go like this, and I'll just turn the visibility of the other layers off just so we can see the selection a little easier, that's all. So with that layer selected, I'll go into the menu bar and choose Select Color Range. And that's all the video is doing. And based on your image down here, the default tool is being used, the eyedropper tool. When you click on, say, the surface area of what you have down here, based on the fuzziness and range, these are just two different ways to adjust the uh, tolerance setting. And it's the uh, tolerance settings of your selection. The range will be very much to a specific color. Seems to be more the case. And fuzziness, this covers more area. So I'm going to subjectively say, yeah, that works just fine for me. But if I hold my left mouse button down, use the eyedropper tool, maybe I come up with something else I like. So there's no, run, there's no proper number for any of this. It's all based on your image. So click OK when you've found something you think works. And that's where I am at about three minutes into the little demo video. So I'll create a new layer for that selection that I have to be inside of. And then I fill that selection with white. So I have my selection. I'll add a new layer. That selection follows me. I go over to my color chips, I can double click on them, I can click on these, swap them around. As long as I have white in the foreground, this is a fill chip. I can then go get the paint bucket tool, I can brush the color in. But if I go up into the menu bar and also choose just edit, fill, foreground color, just like I did in the uh, video, that works just fine too. And keep in mind that these tools aren't specific for this kind of a photograph. They're very commonly used tools. And the only way to know when and at what degree you might need them, and you'll definitely be using them, it's just through practice. So we've got to start somewhere. So why not this image? <laughs> From there, like here, create a layer mask, and that lets us edit this content a bit if we need to. Okay, so that now is over here. And if I want to, if I take black and get my brush, B for brush, it's hotkey command, I can add or subtract from my layer mask and increase or decrease the size of my brush. I can go up here to increase or decrease the size. But I'm lazy, so I use the brackets, left and right. You can see how I'm brushing that in. So with black F down here, I'll change the size of these so we can see this a little better. There, down here where everything's white, if I go like this, you can see where that's black. I've erased the mask, and with the mask erased, I'm not seeing any of that white. I'm seeing that same surface that I had before. So based on the kind of image you're working with, you may or may not want to add in or subtract some of the background elements. Maybe a nice fuzzy edge to the selection might help. It's a subjective thing. There. 
there. So you can see how I'm revealing by adding black to subtract from the mask, I'm revealing what's underneath a little bit more. Is this making reasonable sense, gang? Okay. So what I'll do is I'll... Uh, sorry, Gordon. Uh, how'd you get the mask to appear again? That right there? Yes. Click with that over here, selected. I just clicked right down here in the layer. So oh, okay. That. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. So after I did that, gang, I went up here into my hue and saturation, and I'm not clipping this down to this uh, to the layer directly below it. I'm just turning that off, and I'm moving this layer underneath here, the one that I just made with the snowy surface, and putting it there. That's so. So I've kind of created a nice little random selection for where snow could be. So that snowy layer turned off. The selection is based on color range tool on this object. That's with the snow on, that's, that's with the snow off. And adjust the opacity as you best see fit. Blending modes don't really work well here, not with white. And that's probably about 90% of the project. After this, all that's left is putting the snow on. And we can sort of deconstruct and then reconstruct snow as simple elements. Think of digital noise, just black and white. And we want white and we want it blurred. So how can we make blurry white little flecks, electronic noise? And there's a noise filter in Photoshop. So it just it's our gateway into filters in Photoshop. So somebody give me a sign that we're ready to go and start creating some noise. <laughs> you ready? Okay. So now up here at the top, I just need to create one layer to start with and fill it with white. I can go edit, fill, this layer is going to be the snow, but we'll put some noise in there. There are many different ways to do all this, but this is really simple. Or I can go get the paint bucket tool, which is G and click here. As long as I have white, click done. Just want that filled with white. Then in the menu bar, we'll go up to the top and go filter, noise, add noise. Monochromatic Gaussian, looks like nice electronic noise. Fantastic, that's all we need. 400% looks good. Anything less is just blank, flat, continuous tone white. So that works. And then we can just click OK. So we just created a blank layer, filled it with white. And now as per the little video, where are we here? So now it's going to be time. We'll take our duplicate photo and put soft light on it at the end. It just is a nice way to bring a little uh, color back to everything. Okay. Now here's the new layer. This is where we're making snow in the video almost five minutes in, blank layer, fill it with white.
paint bucket tool. See, this video is eight and a half minutes long almost. And that's a long time for this kind of uh, warm to cool conversion to take. But we're swapping back between the how to video in my video and the uh, actual demo on the Photoshop file. So that 400% monochromatic works for what uh, we need. And then we can soften it. Little blur, Gaussian blur is just standard issue way to soften that up a bit so we don't have diamonds falling through space, but we have snowflakes drifting through air. And then to create a little bit of uh, environment on top of that, add some little more, a little more interest, let's motion blur that a tiny bit as well. Yeah. But overlay mode with white and black will remove all the black. So we're only left with white, so that's the snow. And let's put a little motion blur on it to give it a little life to this. Choose a direction, and there you go. Oh, there's my layer with the snow on it. I'll go up into the menu bar and choose blur, Gaussian blur. Nothing too crazy, that looks fine. Go back in the menu bar, fill, a filter. Blur, motion blur. I'm sure, that angle looks just fine. Maybe not as fast. Sure there. Click OK, and then overlay blend mode. Looks like there's a little bit of snow now. Again, just an introduction to simple filter and then a blending mode. And for those of you working along, let me know when you have that, please. Okay, so I'll zoom out here. And then now I can just make duplicates of this. I'll take this layer and you can duplicate layers the same anyway, any layers the same way. I'll drag that down to here. There's a duplicate, but now I want to select all of that and scale it up in size. So if I just press that thumbnail and hold the control key down, that selects everything. And then if I go into the menu bar and choose, oh, come here, edit, transform, I can start you know, scaling this up. I can choose that. I can just choose free transform, which is easier for what we're doing. Just press control T, control or command T, Gives us little bounding rectangles to hang on to, and we can just scale this up. There. Because the snow flakes that are closer to us are going to be larger. There. And then press enter when you're done, and then I'll duplicate my efforts on that again. Even larger. And then varying degrees of opacity might work for each of those. So I think you can see the logic in the three layers. So back, middle, and foreground just to create a little more depth. Background smaller, foreground larger. And then based on what you want the visual effect to be, maybe working from the back to the foreground, maybe you can adjust the opacity a little bit. Maybe in the background, I don't know, 26%. In the middle ground, 50%, foreground, There, so you can see how that looks. And then if I trash those top two layers and just work with adios, and maybe just duplicate this one and keep things the same size, it, same approach, but different look. And it doubled up, 
it looks much heavier now. Don't scale it up so much, don't blur it up as much. And then I didn't adjust any of the opacity settings. I kept them all at the same 73. If they're all at 100, well, a bit more of a snowstorm. It's all good. Now, how did that work, gang? Not bad. If you're working on a different image, you'll still use the same tools, but you might have to take your time making different selections, that's all. And the final little step was this bottom layer was shoved up here, the, of the actual image was shoved way up here, directly under the snow sandwich between the background snow and the blue. And a nice little soft light was applied to it. The opacity dropped down a lot just to create a nice little nuance, a touch of pop in the colors a tiny bit. That's it. So all of that converts to that. So warm quill cool conversion working with non-destructive editing and adjustment layers, introduction to a couple of filters and working with the color range selection tool. Now, for those of you that worked along with me and you've done this, I'd be happy to take a look at it, not right the second, take a look at it and sign it off as being complete. Of course, it'll be important that you remember how to repeat the process and work with these tools because we'll need to know these tools moving forward for sure. Now, I can do the same thing. I'll do this but I'll take a different image, uh, this one here. Image, image size. Yeah, that's good. Scale that down. Same approach. Yeah, I know I can duplicate those. Doing saturation. Just go like that. That's not bad. I'm sure that works for me. And on top of that, put a little solid on there of some kind of dark blue. So right away, that is this. But now I need to go in here and make some selections so I can start throwing some frost on the ground. Good enough for what I'm doing. There. Using that image as my image to create the selection. With my selection activated, create a new layer by clicking here. That new selection follows me to this new blank layer. And then I'll fill the new layer choosing edit fill with the foreground color, which is white in my case there. We could have gone down here and chosen white. Click OK. Then click on the layer mask icon. The layer mask icon will work when you have a selection. There, there's the selection. And now I can take 
black or white, and with the brush tool, add or subtract from my content to maybe highlight or focus in on different areas to reveal the original material a little bit more. Kind of like that, you can kind of see what I've done there. There. And that's pretty dark. And if you don't like that blue, something more blue and less purple. There. So from that to that in 70 seconds. Then start adding some snow. So blank white layer, filter, noise, add noise, and then back to filter blur. Then go to overlay mode. And you can see because of the lighter colors in the background, you can see you don't see the snow as much. So maybe just duplicate that. But don't change the size of the, the snowflakes. And so with a few layers of that duplicated, that tends to work just fine. So from that to there. And then if this is just brought up here as in the demo, and then we just put a little overlay mode on that, but adjust the opacity way down. It just brings some of the natural colors back just a little bit. So there it is on the visibility of the layer on turned off. Now yeah, make this more obvious. There, turned on, turned off. There. And that's all that happened over here, same thing. In some cases you might need to, you can see down here with the layer mask, with the selection, I duplicated that. So maybe if I take this layer and duplicate it, maybe there, that adds a little more snowy, cool oomph to the picture. If you feel that's needed, make a copy of it and drag it down here. If you decide you don't want it, then you can delete it. Or if you wanted something in between, well then just select that and then adjust the opacity. So you only see a little bit of it then. There, so you're thinking maybe not enough, and maybe that's too much. So somewhere in between. So if I see a couple of these layers, that's fine. So does that make reasonable sense, gang? You'd only get comfortable through the repetition of doing it. Okay. How many people feel they finished this project? I did not. <laughs> A few people have, okay. Okay, so what I'm thinking we could do is there might be a few people Oh, I'll just interrupt myself. I'm looking, yeah, you sent your project yesterday. You sent it again, absolutely. Yep. Remember gang, after I received your, your uh, file, I like to download them as soon as I've got time and then I put them into a folder and then I'll open them up to see if there's any like, opening issues, if there's any, anything corrupt with them. Then I will uh, get around to grading them as soon as I can. Once you have a grade, you, you know, go and check grade center, see if you have a grade and then check the feedback. If you have a less than stellar grade for whatever reason, then 
you always have. Remember, you can always resubmit to improve your grade. You only need to do, should we do all the images? No, just one. I would trust that people who want to learn this, they'll just practice on their own a little bit, just to commit sort of the tools, what they can do to memory in the color range. What time is it right now? It's 1.52. I'm thinking if we take a 20 minute break, everybody can have their, their file up on screen looking just like what you see here. Uh, people that might need an extra couple of minutes or five minutes, then you can have that up on screen. And then you can walk me through, and this is what I would ask, when you come here to this layer mask, if you hold the controller command key down and click on this thumbnail, I can quickly see what you have selected. That's good. Then you can go over here into the adjustment layer and show me that you've desaturated something. Over here with the color fill layer, well, straightforward, it's just a solid fill, so I'll be able to see that some sort of a color. Up here, you've taken the duplicate of this and put overlay mode on it, just so it can make some of the other colors pop a bit. Not critical, but you can see the difference before and after. Just something we should do. And then all the different snowy bits. And that's how long it should take to walk me through that. If you wanted to make the thumbnails large enough so we can all see them, go up into your layers panel in the top right hand corner into the stack of delicious pancakes. Click on that and go down towards the bottom where it says panel options and choose thumbnail size and just go for the large one. And that way we can come back at say 10 after two and be able to look through these and get sign off on them right away. And for people that might need to work on it in class a bit, while I'm looking at these, you could be working on your project and then we can get as much signed off as possible today. For those of you that want to, uh, you have other things to get onto for whatever reason, then you guys can do that and send me the project um, via WeTransfer. But then before we wrap up the session, we can have a little uh, talk about what project five is. And then you guys might be able to find a photo between now and next week that you think would be a, a appropriate and good subject matter for our next project. So how does coming back at 10 after two sound gang and showing screen sharing pictures and getting some sign off, is that good? Okay, thank you. So all I needed was one yeah. Okay. I'm going to pause the recording right now. And yeah, hi, Gordon. Oh, yes, Marion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Actually, I just I have a question. So, oh, sure. uh, okay, so uh, should I make a package with this file? I mean, the PS file, the, the Photoshop? No, the Photoshop file, you should be able to send it just as a Photoshop file. We haven't done anything fancy with connecting other content to it. So there won't be any reason for us to try and and uh, package this up. For those of you that try to go into the menu bar and choose file package and you see package as grayed out, that means your contents automatically by default been embedded in when you place it. You have the option of embedding and linking and doing other things. So 99 times out of 100, this project, you can just send it to me as a Photoshop file. All the layers come along for the ride. You don't have to flatten it or do anything else with it. Okay, so I can, uh, I can, uh send a file directly PSD file, right? Yeah, you can send it, but these files are so large that you'll have to send it through WeTransfer. Oh, okay, definitely I will use the WeTransfer. Okay, thank you so much, Martin. Yeah, you bet, no problem. And for those of you that, uh, I'm just looking at mine, but not be done or good right now. So yeah, not a problem. So we will, uh, we'll come back here, it's just like 10 after two, take a look, see where we're at and then we can move forward from there. Okay, ciao for now, I'll turn my mic off. Okay, Pearl? Yeah, yeah, I'll just uh, open my file. Sounds good. Yeah, and Charlotte, uh, just the Photoshop file, RGB, CMYK, it doesn't matter for this. We're just gonna take a walk through, you guys will take that, take me through and everyone a quick little walk through 
of that warm cool conversion. That's all we're looking at. Okay, uh, should I also uh, show the original image or just the file, Photoshop file? Here, what will happen? Oh, we want to see, we definitely want to see your file like this. So you'll okay. have all the Photoshop file layers. So you'll turn all the layers off like this and expose just this one. And then you just sort of starting from the bottom up, turn them on. And then you'll show me the selection you made there. And then you can click on the uh, hue and saturation adjustment layer and convince me by showing me the saturation has been toned down. And then I can see what kind of at the same time, what kind of blending mode and opacity changes you've made to ensure we've actually incorporated something in that area. And then blending modes for overlay up here. That's it. It's, it's a pretty straightforward walkthrough. And this will okay. convince me you've worked with the tools. That's all. So yeah, I'll sh share my screen. Please. So can you see it? Yep, so let's start at the bottom layer. Turn the top one off, please. Okay, it just messes up the file. Why? Well, we need to have, the snow is gonna be on top of all the other stuff. So that layer three that you have snow. Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so what we do, we start at the bottom, not click on yet your layer five there. Okay, that's good. And with your control key, are you on a PC or a Mac? It looks like a PC. Uh, the, it's Windows. Yeah, if you click on, hold your control key down and click on the white thumbnail in layer five, I can see what you had selected. But hold the control there. So you've got, okay, so you've got that selection. And did you use the color range tool to select that? Yeah. Yeah, from the selector panel. Okay, so there, you've got a selection there. You filled it with white, I can see. Okay, moving up, let's see the hue and saturation. And click on the hue and saturation, that icon there. Let's see what the panel looks like. Okay, so you chose yellows? Yellows. Okay, good, perfect, that's worked. So you've and those. greens and a little bit of cyan also. Sounds because good. And looks good, so you didn't adjust the hue and lightness, which is perfect, okay, great. Now let's get back to layers, please. Yeah. There, click on that. Let's see. And you want to change the blending mode of blue to say overlay or soft light. So go up there. Yes, please. Yeah. Let's try. I sure. Go with either one would work. Normal's not going to, normal would be awful. <laughs> so okay. that's better. Okay. It doesn't look like there's a blue jello or everything. Click on the snowy layer. Okay, we need more snow than that. So if you duplicate, if you press Control D to deselect that marching ant stuff you've got, just press Control D, that'll deselect your selection there. Yeah. Now, if you take your layer three, let's click on that, please. Okay, now drag that layer three down to the plus symbol next to the garbage can at the bottom of the layers panel, and let's duplicate that a bit so we get more snow. Actually, I wanted oh, I see. to give... so scaled up quite a bit. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so you've got that there. I can see. So that's good. Yeah. And then take your layer zero. Yeah. Copy and drag it between, sandwich it between layer three and color fill. So that where, that's where it makes the most sense. There. And if you adjust the opacity down from 72 to something else, lower. Sure, that looks better. Yeah. There. Mm -hmm. And that works for me. Okay. Because the stacking of the orders of the layers has to make a little sense. We want the snow on top of everything. That's why we moved the layer zero right. copy down there. Everything else looks good. So Pearl, that's getting signed off. Okay. Thank you so much. And you do not need, once you guys remember, once you get signed off in class, you do not need to send me your file. Thanks so much, Pearl. That's done. Thank you. Yeah. Who would like to go next? <laughs> Party emoticons, whooping it up. <laughs> okay, Miriam. Yeah, I'm ready for that. Okay. Okay, so let me share. Um... Okay, can you see now? Not at all. 
Okay. Oh, here it's coming through now. Okay, perfect. It was just a little slow, yeah. So just go back to Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There we go. Oh, that was the image. Yeah, all right. Right. So the see, um, mm -hmm. David Attenborough in there. So if you turn the visibility of all the layers, but the bottom one off first, please, that would be good. Okay, I just so turned the visibility of all the layers, but the bottom one off. So turn the eyeball in the left-hand column underneath the word lock. If you just turn all those off on all the top layers, except the bottom one. Uh, you mean this one? No, no. In the layer to the left, each layer has a little eyeball picture. Oh, okay. Got it. This one. Right? But leave the bottom. No, leave the bottom one on. Turn all the others off. Okay. Um, no, the bottom one on. Yeah. And everything else off. Okay. And that way we get to see there. That's what the original looks like. Yeah. Terrific. Then, okay. yeah, work your way up from the bottom. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. And if you hold the, yeah, I can see the selection. That'll work. Sure, that works for me. Now, hue and saturation. Click on that and let's see what kind of. And then click on the hue and saturate in that little half moon picture. Double click on that to bring the property panel up and show me where you've desaturated. Okay, so. No, you don't want that. You want to use the saturation slider and move it to the left. Okay. Well, more the saturation because we want to get rid of that coolness. So go up a, a level there. Yeah, and move that to the left. See, that gets a lot of the color out in a cooler, darker day. Yeah, so that would work. Sure, like that. Because we're desaturating and we're, we're reflecting back on what we do with some of the other color projects. Go to layers again, and now let's go up to the color fill. Okay. Yeah, turn that on. Click on the uh, color fill blue chip. This one? Yeah, please. I'll click cancel. Yeah, you just double click there. And let's just adjust. Yeah, we can make that, we can adjust the opacity down even more because we just try our best just to try and make it look a little realistic. So the opacity, if you can adjust that from 49% to maybe, I don't know, 25. Okay. Sure. There, that's a little better down in there, sure. And now let's go to the, the snow layers next instead of that one that you're on. Okay, sure, we'll do that. And click on the snow. Okay, lots, okay, perfect, that's good. Soft light. Now all those layers, have you adjusted the size of some of them at all? Some of the actual snowflakes in them? So if you turn those snow layers back on to put, turn the visibility on again, please. Um, okay. Yeah, turn the visibility of all those three snow layers on, please. That would be good. Well, now with that top layer, layer two, copy two, if you hold the control key down and click, on that thumbnail, that'll select everything in there. I'm just going to get you to scale that up. That's all. Okay. Yeah. So if you hold the control, uh, if you're on a, looks like you're on Windows. So if you just, yeah, click on the thumbnail, hold the control key down at the same time, that'll just select everything. Or just oh. go con control A. Oh, okay. I think that's something wrong. Okay. My window, uh, it's, it's a window, right? So I will click on the control and then B. Yeah, both at the same time. Yeah, that's just the quick way. Uh, you're clicking on the layer here. Let's do it a different way. Just click cancel. Just go and choose press control A to select all them. Because we want to just there. And now go control T. There, now click on one of those corner handles and just scale the snow up. That's all. Yeah, scale it up a ton. No, up a ton, make it much larger. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's, that's all I'm getting at there. Okay. See, and the opacity for that layer is at zero. So you want to just, instead of zero, give it something. Sure, see, that's better. Okay. There we go, that, that's good. Press uh, enter. There, now I'm convinced you know how to work with the selection tool, color range, adjustment layers, um, blending modes, opacity, and adjust the size of some content using uh, control T. So Miriam, that works for me. Can you go, one last thing, can you go into the menu bar and choose image?
and image size. Let's see how big this is. Yep. Okay. Change where it says inches. Get rid of inches. Change the unit of measurement to pixels. Okay. Good. So it's within parameters. Perfect. There. Thank you so much. That's done. Okay. Perfect. So should I submit? Uh, should I submit them? Nope. That was your submission. It's just an online because of the nature of the project. It's easy to assess if the uh, criteria has been met. Uh, okay. Perfect. Okay, Next thank go. you. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, who would like to take control next? Oh, I will say, yep. Yeah, um, once you've shown your work and you have other things to do, please feel free to go on to the next events of the day. If you feel like sticking around, great. If not, thanks for your participation and patience today. All appreciated. And next week before uh, day before class, I'll fire off an agenda email. So if you have other things that you need to do, would like to do, have to do, you're going to show your work later. It doesn't have to be in class today. It's, you know, you know when it's due, it's due next week or the week after we have lots of time, then feel free to go on and do that. Once everybody who desires to show their work in class for sign off today has finished, I'll show you guys what you're going to do for project uh, five and tell you what you need to bring to class next week. But I can find a damaged, if for those of you who are leaving, find a damaged, broken up, cracked, blemished, if you want to bring your own photo in. I'm supplying some old photograph. We're going to get into some image restoration and colorization. But I have some images we can work with for practice. But if you have something you think might work for that, then great. But it just can't be soft focus. It has to be an old, really rubbishy, cracked uh, photograph. But we can take a look at some of those next week. OK, so who would like to? I saw a name in here. Trahan or us, Calica. You guys, yeah, whoever grabs the screen next, that's the name I'm writing down. I trust you good people to self-organize. Uh, I guess I'll go next. <laughs> that sounds good, yeah. All right. Uh, is my screen showing? Yes, yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see. That's, yeah. That's snow selection. So let's, when you go to the snow selection, if you click on that thumbnail and hold the control key down, just want to see what you select. Or oh, this one. That one, yeah. And then press, hold the control key down and then click on that thumbnail. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. Okay, great. Thanks. Cool. And this one, the saturation with the yellow. Here, what you want to do is click on that little, yeah, the thumbnail little picture there, mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. A double click on it to bring, and let's not clip that to the snow layer below. Let's get it to affect all. So in the properties panel. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, let's do that. Good, and so then, that works. Let's see what kind of, yeah, you've gone in there. It's Wonderful. yellows. And this one's a bit of the greens. Sure. Yeah, and nothing wrong, gang, with you going in and doing this with a couple of different uh, hue and saturation mm. uh, adjustment layers. Okay, so good. Color fill next. We've got a nice blue. Click on that layer, please. And let's see what kind of blending mode we have there. Soft, uh, light. soft light. Okay, great. And then moving to adding a little bit the color back. Yeah, perfect. And now let's click on all the snow all at once. There, and if you wanted to, yeah, that works well. And if you wanted to duplicate the snow and get even more, because three just works okay, but if you needed more for mm -hmm. fun, if you could just drag layer four copy down to the addition sign a few times so we can really turn it into an ugly snow day. Yeah. There. So <laughs> multiple times. Yeah, exactly. And it wouldn't take any time at all to remove even a ton more of that green, but it, it's uh, it's all good. So let's go and check to see the image size of what you're working with. Uh, sure. Perfect, yeah, done. That's it. All right. Yeah, all this time, I'm, you guys have to suffer through listening to me, Gab, and then 40 seconds later, it's signed off. <laughs> no, it helps, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay. What are we looking at now? Who's up next? May I? Yes. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Oh. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Yeah, you bet. Okay. okay. So I made two selections for the snow. Yeah, we could have you. Yeah, that'll that'll work because we, I would have chosen a lot more in the ground where she's running, but that works for what we're doing. That's not a problem. Okay, and here in saturation, you've got the saturation toned down. So that's yeah, you made some good choices there. So that's desaturated nicely. So it's definitely cooler right away. Yeah, let's see color fill. Yeah, let's turn. That has to be a different um, blending mode. So if you go to the color fill layer. Mm -hmm. And instead of thirty percent opacity. Maybe we'll experiment with a couple of things. Adjust the 30 down to maybe 15. That's a little more realistic. Also, instead of color mode, if you did soft light or overlay, let's see what that looks like as well. And now with that soft light mode, maybe adjust the opacity from 15 to maybe 30 okay. or even higher. Yeah, I'll bring it, go up to 70. Yeah, see, so we're just demonstrating that you can use a couple of different blending modes and a combination or in concert with opacity settings, come up with a, a good realistic looking result and uh, change the, uh, based on the colors of the images you're working with. I'm not so sure, but I'm still with your uh, ground. It looks like you've knocked holes through your selection with those layer one, layer two, but we'll get back to that in a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you've got, that's so just leave what you have the way it is there. Let's take a look at that layer zero copy. Okay. And then if you click on the full layer for layer zero copy, let's see what kind of blending mode you have on it. Uh, it's multiply. If you multiply, I'll double the intensity of the, the objects. If you choose soft light or overlay, I think I know what you're going for there, but it mm -hmm. still works. It would work well. Sure. Should I go for soft light then? Sure. Yeah. Over multiply is good when you have a dull image and you want to just bring it back to full life. Mm -hmm. And you can see now with your layer three, two copy and layer three copy, it looks like you masked out the girl so she didn't have snow on her. Is that what the plan was? was? <laughs> Actually, I wanted to highlight it more. So that's why I just uh, reduced the razor opacity and then I used it. Oh yeah, if, if you did it deliberately, then that's that's fine. Okay, what I'm gonna ask you to do now for a second is turn the visibility of everything off except the bottom layer. Okay. And with the bottom layer selected, go up and choose select and color range, please. Now with the eyedropper tool, Yeah, you can change the fuzziness from 40 to something else. That's pretty, it's pretty rough. Go up higher with it. And then click on the, the ground by the girl's feet with the eyedropper tool. I just want to see what gets selected. See, that's, that's a little more realistic, I think. So click OK. Now click on a new layer icon. And then choose to fill that selection with white. So that would be the background color this time. Sure, that'll work. And now click on the add layer mask thumbnail. So we have a layer mask. See that ground cover looks a little bit better to me than what I saw before. So that's what I wanted to run you through. I think that's that approach would be a little more effective Okay. than what Seems I good. see right now. So, and I needed us to know how to go through that process. That layer one and two look a little uh, sketchy to me, but layer four, that's the way we need to go. So I'm not exactly sure what you did with one and two, but it's fine. I, I'm, I'm conf it's confirmed now because you went through this process that uh, to me, you know how to work with that color range tool. 
So that's terrific. That's all I needed to see. I can work with that and I can sign that off. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Who would like to go next? Sounds good, yeah, sure you go. After Lee, is anybody else planning on going? I'm just trying to plot out how to use our time. Yeah, go now, please, yeah. Okay, good, so I'll just start writing down a few more names. Okay, yeah, so if you go, that would be perfect. Uh, and uh, there it is, we're coming through. Yeah, it's the original picture. Sure. And turn that on. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, by yeah. chance, is that a place you happen to holiday at one time or hike at? Yeah. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. Where is that? I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, it's from my country. It's a picture from my country, Iran. Oh, it's beautiful. Thanks. You it must have been tough to walk away from that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Check out the hue and saturation. Uh, saturation. And uh, let's just see. Yeah. One yellow yeah. color, actually. Great. So, yeah. Well thought out and chosen there for the color um, and channel. Go to the blue color fill. Yeah, we'll see some removal. The blue color. That's good. Yeah, for sure. And if, once you guys turn the visibility of the layer on, if you guys can click on the layer and activate it so we can see if there's any blending mode changes or opacity, that would be good. Yes, yeah, so if there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, layer zero copy. Copy. Yeah, that's nice. Every image will have different settings because of level and intensity of the color pixels. And now let's see the snow. Snow is the first layer. Uh, it's the second layer and the last one. Yeah, so there. So we sort of simulate moving from cool to warm. You've changed the, the tone of it, certainly. And you've worked with the layer mask itself to edit some of the grays, blacks, and whites. Works for me. Terrific. Oh, let's go up into the menu bar and choose image, image size and see. Uh, Yeah. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's exactly. Thank you. Uh, quickly, guys, how do you how do you find this project? Pretty easy. Let's see. Anybody else? It looks like. Uh, Yep, you're ready to go? Sure, let's do it. Can you see mine? Yes, I can. Let's see your layer structure here. Open up the layer panel all the way. Okay, and then extend the layer panel out. So make it very tall so we can see all the layers at once, please. Okay, there we go. And uh, where is the snow? Where That layer three, I think, needs to be. Did you deliberately put layer three above hue and saturation? This here? Yes. Is that filled with white? I can't tell. You need that selection filled with white. Uh... Yeah, edit, fill, or click OK. Here, can we, let's do another, um, yeah, let's do another selection. If you can turn that layer three visibility off, please. Okay. And then go down to uh, the add new layer icon, the plus symbol next to the garbage can. There. This one? Yes, please. 
there and then drag that layer four just above the background copy layer, please. There. Now, if, do you still have that selection? Yeah. How about the actual, the marching ants disappeared. So what we'll do is, if you go back to your layer three, I was I wanted you just to take that selection you had and move it into a new layer. So what we'll do is just make a new color range selection. And so everything's good so far. So if you click on your background copy and then go up into the menu bar and choose select color range. And then click on the boardwalk area. Sure, we'll do that, that'll work. Click okay. There, so now click on layer four and now choose edit fill and uh, well, change the color. We want to fill with white. So click on foreground color there, that'll work. Not okay, because you filled with that other color. That'll, yeah. Why it doesn't change? Yeah, uh, that's just what you need to do. Let's do this again, delete layer four. Drag it to the trash can. There yeah, and then there. Now click on. You already have the selection active. So if you click on the new add new layer, add new layer plus button. There. Now go edit fill. Foreground there. Now click on the layer mask icon. That little next one there. Yeah. See now. That, that looks good the way it is. So now you've isolated based on your color range selection an area that's going to be filled with white. So now if click on your, so that's good. That worked out okay. So click on hue and saturation two. We don't need two saturations unless you plan on having to. But it looks like you deliberately did that, which is good. But let's see what kind of adjustments you made in hue and saturation. So if you double click on that hue and saturation little, um, yeah, and then go in, Let's see where you desaturated somewhere. Did you choose a channel where it says master and go into yellow or green or anything and change something there? Like, where did you make the change? Um, I, I maybe not this one and this. Sure, there it is there. Okay, so yeah, so just, we could even desaturate that some more. So if you just desaturate even more, move that saturation slider to the left even more. There. And you can move the lightness slider to the left some more too. There, it's, it's, we want to make it kind of perfect. That's good. Now let's delete your layer three. And let's delete that hue and saturation one. Yep, there. Now let's see your color fill. We'll turn that on. There, that's nice and cool. So that works. And let's see layer two. Let's get some snow in there. And there too. Now, how much snow is happening? Let's make one more snowy layer for fun. If you create a blend, a brand new blank layer, please. Oh, okay. There, and just fill it with white. Then let's go up into the menu bar and choose filter. Noise, add noise. Sure, that'll work. And then choose filter noise, a uh, filter blur, I mean, Gaussian blur. Yeah, sure, that's good. And then let's choose filter and give it a little bit of movement, blur, motion. Sure, that's good. There, and then turn that layer into overlay mode. There. And then duplicate that layer a few times. So drag it down and, and so we, you know, we have coppers. That's all I'm looking for. Just wanted to see more of the snow. It's because of the, the vibrancy of the background in the sky that that's why it's just a little tough to see the snow, but there. 
that works for me. And it's just a little bit more of adding a couple other layers and tweaking things a bit, but still using the same tools. Wonderful. Oh, let's check the file size, uh, the image size. Let's choose image and image size, please. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So we've got six people that was signed off, added to the other people that are uh, that I've already marked, and I'm sure I received some emails with um, your submission. Once you have sent, once for all projects that get full sign off in class, which is what we're doing now, you do not need to send me the project. There's nothing I can do with it at, at that point. We just had a nice, uh, good, clear look at what's inside of it this uh, during this kind of a session with the screen share. And then this way, everybody can get a sense of what the expectations are and what we're looking for. Other projects will be far too complex to approach in this manner. But for what we're doing with this project, this works just fine. And that means after class is over, for these projects that are signed off in class, I'll just go right into Grade Center and I type 100 in in the Grade Center fields. The feedback that I would normally type in the rubric, I don't do that now because you just had the same feedback verbally. So you'll just see suddenly magically a 100% a value typed in for Pearl Merriam's Gallic, uh, uh, Dejan uh, Norush's. Um, Trans, excuse me, names. I'm sure I got one of those names right. <laughs> so before I show you guys what we're doing next week then, and what uh, you might need, you need to think about and maybe get ready for class for next week and come prepared to class with, are there any other Project 4 questions? Okay. Are you guys ready to take a look at the next project then? We're not going to start it today. I just need you guys to know about it so you can pick out a, a photograph to make it more interesting for yourselves. Okay. It's a screen share. And I'll go make all this stuff available now. There we go. So weekly course modules. We're now taking a look at image restoration and colorization, more Photoshop stuff, clone stamp, spot healing. We're always going to build upon what we worked with before. So more brush, eyedropper adjustment layers, dodging and burning, more destructive and not um, non-destructive editing, and some file saving. And that's due week seven. And week eight, which is reading week break, if people need a, a chance to work on that during reading, this during reading week break. And, and I know it's only week four right now. What happens in the second half, we, we pick up our game a bit. I don't want people sort of left behind working on projects in the first half of the semester when we jump into something new in the second. Okay, so I'm just taking a look in here. Here's sort of before and after. It's a general sense very quickly of what it is we're going to be looking at. So you can see here's a, a miserable old photograph that's really damaged. And here it would, here's what it looks like restored. And here's a black and white just colorized. We're doing combinations of both of these sorts of things. That's the direction we're going to go. get into it in a lot more detail later on, but here's some photos you can use or to possibly pick from that you could use for inclusion in this project. If you download that and take a look at them, here, I've got these somewhere.
Now here's what you would end up seeing. So there's a few options here, but it gives you a sense of how damaged the photographs can actually be. Oops, I just clicked on that one. Or how damaged they need to be. Yeah, so this is the direction we're going. So if you're going to find an old family photo from somewhere, then you choose to work on that instead of the images I've supplied, make sure they're damaged to this level, not just a black and white photo or something that's blurry. That's not what we're doing. We need something damaged and blemished and cracked that's black and white, and then we're going to colorize it. So it has to be an older photo. But I've supplied a whole bunch to choose from, and uh, we can go from there. And then there's a little reminder section about what's due in class and when. So it always looks back on the previous projects. And we'll have a little exercise we can work on in class to get ourselves started. So similar to how we had a little in-class exercise with this, we can begin the process with uh, an image that we have in here. I've supplied all the videos we need to walk us through the tools and how they're used to create uh, what we're going to work on, which is to color correct and get rid of blemishes and, and uh, cracks and such in photographs. Now, here are some reference examples just to show you the direction that this can be, uh, we can go. This is the image we'll work with for practice, but before we colorize anything, we'll take this and we'll turn it into ultimately this, but you can see none of the blemishes are there. We start making selections, we're saving selections, we're working non-destructively, working with hue and saturation and colorization, these sorts of things. You can see how there's very little detail around the chair. We can bring a bit of it back using dodging and burning, which is an old, a couple of old uh, darkroom terms. And when you spend a little bit of time, you can go from this to this. It's very nice. So this just very visually and quickly gives you a sense of the level of detail you can bring to old images. Yeah, so roll back up here. And here are a few student reference examples. Here's a before and an after. So I put these files together so you can see in such a way that allows you to see the before image of the photograph. And then here's the beautiful finished version. And here's the layer structure. You get groups of layers happening as well as a bunch of other things that we haven't touched yet. Before picture, and here's the after picture, the layer structure. So you get a sense of, of again, the direction we're going. Uh, let's see what, you need to find something that's cracked would be best. If you don't find one that's cracked, then we're not going to be able to use the cloning and brush healing tool. I have pictures that you could work with. That's where these come into play. So if you can't find something that's all black and white and then cracked and blemished, don't worry, I got you covered. Again, you can see there's Elvis at the diner and here's Elvis all cleaned up. So we're also saving our selections now. And this is an equally good uh, submission as this. This one person spent a little more time using the brush and they had more layers in here, but they chose to go that route, but they you know easily here, they met all the project requirements, not a problem. But the first step will be here we'll take our original object we'll drop it down here we'll clean it all up with the clone and brush healing tool then we'll adjust hue and saturation non-destructively to edit out the color so whatever tone we have it's going to be black and white then we start making selections but there's a different way we can make selections and then we save them and for every 
subject matter area, ears, uh, trim on the collar, the jacket, the buttons, the shoulder uh, decorations, the eyes, the lips. We need to create a separate layer for every color. And then we can go into each of those layers. We adjust the opacity and then we'll choose a color. But the way we sample the color is we'll have another Photoshop file open that has that's a color image representative of that era. And we'll be sampling from other images, not from within our image, to draw color from and put into our own color palette. And then we'll work with that. And that's where, in some cases, I've supplied these little color palettes. So it's just the starting point for us to begin to sample from outside imagery, not something in here, it could even be something on your desktop, colors that would be appropriate for this person. You can decide if you use this person, if we're going to go with red, green, or blue, or whatever for the outfit, but we want things to look natural. We are not going to be working with over the top high, uh, over the top blown out colors, but we want nice clean edges. We don't want anything we can see that's glowing from space. So nice clean edges, good selections, save selections, and there's more, but this gives you a sense of where this next image restoration and colorization project is going to go. So you have a lot of content to download. You have this section here, Photoshop introduction, image restoration, colorization, the project, <clears throat> five PDF, and then photos you can work with on the project. But we'll start on that next week. And if you and next week will be week five. So between our week, uh, this project and our um, EPUB fixed layout project, you guys have you know reasonable amount of stuff to work on in my class. That's why we're going to use these projects to carry us through to the reading week break. But we will formally start on this stuff next week. Any questions, gang? I'm hoping that gives you a, a good, quick visual sense of what we're going to be working on. But again, don't don't start on the project. Don't do anything with it. I've had people try that, and then they show up with a photograph that they thought was damaged enough, and there's nothing like that. There's some. There's a little tiny tear, or they just chose to ignore the <laughs> specs and colorize a favorite old family photograph. So. There we go. I would suggest you just you go down and open up and explore the files that uh, I've supplied. Get a sense of the damage level we're looking for and use that to help guide you if you're looking for a photograph somewhere else that you want to work with in this project. But you can really do a heck of a good job here with this. That's beautiful stuff going black and white to color spectacular. So that's what I wanted to uh, introduce us to at the end of the session today, gang, so we know what we can come to class with for next week and we can start our image restoration colorization work. And then, oh, like I said, I'll start uh, taking a look at the projects, the other projects that have been sent to me. And when I, as soon as I have a chance, I'll be inputting grades and giving feedback there for the people that showed their projects in class. The feedback was verbal, and I'll be typing in 100% for the six of you. And that's the, that's the scoop for today. Are there, is there anything anybody can think of? Maybe anything I've missed that needs addressing? Okay, that's good then. So I think what we can do is we can probably wrap up for now. And I'll thank everyone again. Thank you for your time, your participation, and patience. I was a little sleepy today. <laughs> but uh, some nice work. It's wonderful that I've uh, been able to take a look and share the screen like this. I love when we can do that. It's inspiring. It feels good for everybody as well, I think. So. so have a great rest of the week. It's only Tuesday. And I'll fire off my agenda email to all of us again next week, Monday. And we know what the routine is for our class by now. So take care, everyone. I will um, stop the recording very soon. And once 
I have received the fully processed um, recording link. I'll send that to you in another email. So you click on that and then you can download what you need to download. If you feel like taking a look at the, the session recording, if you think it helps, then fantastic. But that finished link uh, that allows you access to the final processed work isn't usually available for hours from now. So thanks again, gang. I am stopping, uh, I'm pausing the recording right now. Oh, sure, Emily, yeah, do it. Yeah, do it for sure. And have a great rest of the week. So ciao, and I'll take a look at your picture there, Emily. Come on, picture. See, Emily has started screen sharing, just waiting for the photo. <laughs> or I'll pause the recording right now, though, or I'll stop it. So take care, gang.